Finally! I've escaped Florida! Now where the heck am I? Did you lift anything heavy? I told you! It's not oh, hey, Johnny. Hey, sup, bro? How you doing? Well, I'm only one video away from finishing my Selling You On SMT series, and I just thought... I don't want to do it. So you're just gonna abandon it before the finish line? Yeah, I got bored. Nah, man, I ain't gonna let you do that! It's only apocalypse? That won't be too hard. <sighs> yeah, okay, let's do it. By the way, because of Apocalypse's nature as a narrative sequel to SMT4, there will be massive spoilers for the story and lore of that game. There's your warning. Following the release of Shin Megami Tensei 4, there were several people at Atlas who were interested in doing a Maniacs version of the game. For those who don't know, Maniacs is the name of the enhanced re-release of SMT Nocturne. In it, there were various gameplay adjustments, an incredibly large dungeon, and a brand new ending. As time went on, this SMT4 Maniacs grew bigger and bigger, eventually reaching a point where it was an entirely different game. It was then decided to turn the game into a full-blown sequel instead. Returning staff included SMT4's director Kazuyuki Yamai, who this time took up a producer role. The position of director was left to Satoshi Oyama, who was previously the main programmer on SMT4. Ryota Kazuka returned to compose the game, which I know this is the objective part of the video, but holy hell does he kill it again. While the world and original scenario was based on Kaneko's writings, the script for this game was written by Yusuke Miyata. Miyata was a fresh face to the series, having previously worked on The Wonderful 101, Metal Gear Solid, and a few Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm games. Since Apocalypse, he would return to Platinum, where he would become the director of Bayonetta 3. I'm only bringing him up because I wanted to share this revelation with everyone else. The guy who wrote Apocalypse is now the director of Bayonetta 3, what the hell? Masayuki Doi also returned as character designer, as well as making his debut as the new series demon designer. Doi was tasked with designing all of the new characters and demons, as well as taking the demons designed by those freelance common writer guys they hired for 4, and bring them in line with the art style of the rest of the game, such as Napaya, Medusa, and Lucifer. Sadly, no Minotaur. I really wish he stuck around for this game. The major themes of the game include the making or breaking of bonds, monotheism versus polytheism, immaturity, and deicide. In the past, Shimagami Tensei had games themed to be specific alignments, such as SMT2 being law-themed and Nocturne being chaos-themed. For this game, they decided to theme it around a neutral alignment. While the law and chaos endings are available, they're treated more like early endings, happening around the end of the second act. The main endings are instead variations of neutral. These endings, dubbed Bonds and Massacre, focus particularly on putting humanity first and God second in their own unique ways. To announce the game, Shimagami Tensei 4's website was covered with a rocky surface. When 1500 tweets had been reached, the surface broke, revealing the game. It would eventually be released in Japan on February 10th, 2016, while it wouldn't be released in North America until September 20th the same year. The game received positive reviews in both Japan and the West, though it has since become a divisive entry in the series for fans in the West. The game would be titled Shimagami Tensei 4 Final. The title was chosen to represent the game being the final part of 4's story. However, outside of Japan, it was decided to change the name as Final is just incredibly confusing. It makes it seem like it's the second version of SMT4 and not a sequel. Atlas USA, as they were known at the time, put a lot of effort into deciding on a name that would give the same implications as the Japanese title, while being easier to understand for English speakers. Various subtitles were considered, before ultimately landing on the name Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse. Apocalypse takes place in an alternate universe from the original game, picking up shortly before the ending of 4's neutral route. Flynn, the main character of the first game, is uniting the citizens of Tokyo in an attempt to resurrect the guardian of the city, Masakado will free them all and bring an end to the conflict between Merkaba and Lucifer. At the same time, you play as Nanashi, a young boy living in Tokyo who is undergoing training to become a hunter. However, not long into the game, Nanashi is killed by a demon, but before Nanashi can descend into the afterlife, another demon named Dogda approaches Nanashi and offers to resurrect him, in exchange for him to become Dogda's godslayer. In the original game's universe, Nanashi rejects Dogda's offer, leading to the events playing out the way they do. In the universe of Apocalypse, however, Nanashi accepts his offer, leading the world down a very different path. 
Accompanying Nanashi on this journey is a very large cast of characters, many of which are important to the plot of the game, while others are way too present for me to not mention. So it'll take a moment to introduce them all. First is Asahi, Nanashi's childhood friend. She, much like Nanashi, wishes to become a hunter and help society return to the way it was before she was born. Next is Navar, that one asshole from the beginning of SMT4, who becomes a samurai along with the rest of the game's main cast. Wait, hold on, I got the wrong image up. There we go. Yep. This is Navar in Apocalypse. How's that? Following him is Nozomi, a side quest exclusive character from the original SMT4. She's a newly appointed queen of the fairies who is blessed by the goddess Danu, Dada's mother. Not only is she upgraded to main character status, but she also comes with a brand new design and voice actress. I guess Laura Bailey was too busy or something. We also have Hallelujah, a young member of the Ashurakai. Hallelujah is a weak but loyal person who wishes to help return the city to some level of normalcy. After him is Gaston, Navarre's younger brother. In the time since Navarre escaped to Tokyo, Gaston became a samurai working for the Eastern Kingdom of Mikado. He, much like his brother, is very egotistical and arrogant, though his dedication to his kingdom is worn on his sleeve. Then there is Toki, a masked young girl raised by the Ring of Gaia to be an emotionless assassin. And finally, we have Isabeau, the heroine from SMT4. Oh, we're not done with the cast just yet, yo! As we also have a few new characters to talk about. First up is Flynn, the protagonist of SMT4. While no longer the playable character, Flynn is integral to the game's plot and is the center of many of the happenings of Apocalypse. Next is the Divine Powers, which are essentially the game's main antagonists, led by the Hindu god Krishna, the Nordic god Odin, and the Buddha himself, Maitreya. They seek to overthrow Yahweh by creating the world, so they are in control. Another way to put it is that they believe in polytheism, while Yahweh believes in monotheism. And finally, we have Dagda, the Celtic god of Earth, knowledge, fertility, and really just a lot of other stuff. Dogta revives Nanashi in exchange for him becoming his god slayer. While he starts the game off working with the divine powers, he quickly breaks off from them, as his goal, while similar, is different in one crucial aspect. Dogta values individualism and freedom above all else. The gameplay of Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse is, as you can suspect, pretty similar to Shin Megami Tensei 4. However, there are some key gameplay changes that are different enough to make note of alongside one brand new mechanic and two others that have been reworked pretty drastically. In terms of more minor but important changes, insta-kill spells such as Hama and Mudo have had their chance to insta-kill an enemy made exclusive to when you are smirking. If you are to use them when you aren't smirking, they instead do light and dark damage. Other additional effects added while smirking has been added, such as Power Punch potentially making enemies dizzy. The UI has also been enhanced and added to. For instance, you can now rearrange the order of a unit's skills, while your map on the bottom screen has been reworked so that the game is effectively paused when you're using it. The new mechanic introduced in this game is the Jade Dagger. As you run around an area, you'll come across this green portal looking thing called a Power Spot. Power spots fill the Jade Dagger with spirit energy, allowing Navar to wield it and destroy wraith walls that hold treasure, wraith barriers that block your way, and even enemies that are lower level than Nanashi. However, it loses this energy as you move around, so you'll need to decide your plan of action before you power it up. As previously mentioned, there have been two mechanics that have been reworked. The first is skill affinities. While in SNT4, affinities were only a factor for Flynn, Apocalypse expands them to demons as well. However, they work differently. While Flynn and Nanashi build their skill affinities through Demon Whisper, demon affinities are based on what they're resistant or weak to. If it's a move they like, the skill will have a positive affinity, boosting their effectiveness. Meanwhile, if they don't like it, the skill will be hit with a negative affinity, which harms it instead. For instance, a demon like Nekomata is going to like to use physical attacks, giving them a plus two affinity. However, she hates buffs and debuffs, giving them minus two affinity. The other mechanics that have been drastically reworked is the partner system. In SMT4, you only had access to three partners at any given time. And not only that, but they were chosen at random. 
In Apocalypse, you can choose between seven partners to participate in battle, each with their own distinct style. Asahi focuses on healing and recovery spells. Navar will buff your party, debuff the enemy, and use various elemental stones in your inventory to attack the enemy. Nozome focuses on gun skills and inflicting ailments. Hallelujah summons his personal demon, Chironupu, to protect his allies from ailments, or granting them endure. Gaston uses very strong physical attacks, while also sometimes just outright stealing your turns. Toki has a focus on physical skills, but more specifically has a focus on instant kill attacks. And lastly, Isabeau is a jack of all trades, as she can buff, heal, and attack with elemental spells. Each partner has their own level, HP, and resistances. As they level up, they can obtain new skills, making them all viable and incredibly useful throughout the game. Your partner also has an assist gauge that fills up one bar at a time after your active partner takes a turn. Once full, all of your partners team up to interrupt the enemy's turn, cast one or two support skills on you before attacking the enemy one by one, leading to some seriously massive damage. It's a real all-out attack if you catch my drift. But the best part is that partners will never attack an enemy with a skill that can cause a foe to smirk. No need to worry about any Walter vs. Minotaur moments. Now when something bad happens, there's no one to blame but yourself. You know, going back to the fan reception over Apocalypse, it just really gets me thinking, you know? I just really gotta voice my opinion on the subject. It's about time for this discourse to end. And it's the dog lobster that will bring this to a close. I think... No! No! Someone help me! I don't want, I don't want to go back! Ah! Johnny? Johnny? No, 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 John, John, no, please come back. It'll be weird. It's weird if it's only my opinion, please. I need to write your coattails for views. Please come back. <sighs> okay. Okay. Calm down. You can figure this out. I'm just gonna turn around and somebody will be standing behind me that can solve the problem. <laughs> Ow! What the hell? Listen, you son of a bitch. I drive all the way down from Canada to your broken down shack to talk about a game I've never even played. My car gets blown up by Marsha's bomb. I've been stuck here for six months sleeping on your floor, and you haven't even noticed? Hey, Gab, do you want to give your opinion on Apocalypse? Don't change the subject! Alright, Maka asked me for my thoughts on the game, so it's time to give them. When it comes to Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse, the community is pretty much divided between adorning love for it or hating it with every fiber of their being. Amongst all the chaos, I sit in between them, as I appreciate all the quality of life changes made from 4, but the story and the characters are what knock this title down a level for me. Starting the game off strong, we're killed by demons and resurrected by a god as a god slayer, brought back in exchange for our services in this alternate timeline. Unfortunately, later on during our adventures with our friends, we unleash a powerful demon who intends to destroy the universe and reshape it as his own. Like every SMT title, you'll have some harsh choices to make that will lead to one of the many outcomes for the game. I always felt like this was a more friendly title in the series, considering its heavy focus on friendship and working together, and the role the characters seem to play in the plot. When it came down to who was actually coming back to the game, there were specific changes that were made to returning roles like Nozomi, which I personally didn't care for. In the case of others like Navarre, Flynn, Isabeau, I found a new appreciation for their growth in this sequel. Flynn was already one of my favorite protagonists, so it was exciting to continue his story from an alternate perspective. When it comes to my feelings on the characters, we of course have the protagonist, Nanashi, who has a very eccentric punk look to him along with a prominent green slash on his cheek. He is one of my least favorite character designs in the entire series, featuring a mohawk, a green jumpsuit, and knee pads that make him look like a Fallout 3 character. I do, however, feel like he's quite appropriately dressed, given the setting. I just don't care for it, and I never liked the more aggressive look or vibe he gave off. However, there were a bunch of cute outfits you could buy for him in-game, like the maid, retailer exclusives, Sailor Boy, and a few returning from the previous entry. Your best friend in this game is Asahi, a cute girl with black hair, grey eyes, blue dress, and a white pilot's hat complete with a pair of goggles. You've known her since childhood and she travels with you in hopes to become a great hunter like her father. You can tell how she feels about Nanashi when you're introduced to other female characters because her jealousy shines through. 
Regardless of that, she proves to be a positive support character throughout the game, with her peppy personality, and she kind of grew on me for that reason. Nozomi the Fairy Queen is a returning character from SMT4 and probably has the most off-putting redesign. Considering we're in an apocalypse trying to survive, she's wearing green sunglasses, a red jacket and shorts, along with stockings and garter belts and boots. I prefer the original design that actually made her feel like a badass demon hunter we know her to be. The most unfortunate part though was probably the changes to her character's personality, adding these weird motherly fanservice traits which just never felt quite right. One of my personal favorite designs in the game came from Toki. When you originally meet her, she wears a black oni mask with purple hair, a black bodysuit, and a purple poncho to conceal her identity. As a solo assassin, she's quiet and was raised not to show emotion, but over time she starts to show her true feelings for Nanashi and isn't afraid to broadcast them to everyone. To me, she always felt like the little sister of the group, constantly needing her friends' help to reach her goals and saving her along the way. Gaston was one of the more interesting personalities, being a young samurai from the Eastern Kingdom of Mikado, giving us those SMT4 vibes with his medieval cloak. I remember him most for despising his brother Navarre for tarnishing their family's name before his death. He always came across as an arrogant jerk, especially in the beginning, but as time went on and when he eventually joins your party, he becomes a more likable character and one I actually used a decent amount. I'm super excited to talk about this one because it's my favorite character in this game. That would be my best boy, Hallelujah. He's a cocky young member of the Ashurakai dressed in a dark grey suit and yellow sports jacket who features prominent blue eyes and pointy ears. He originally joins your party to keep an eye on you, but eventually sways sides. I always kept in mind his original goal when he joined, but I was happy when he joined us officially as our resident outcast. You're going to be hearing about the divine powers fairly often, as they quickly become your rivals in this title. They are an organization made up of the gods Odin, Krishna, and Maitreya, who are fed up with the current universe ruled by the current creator. I always hated Krishna, I never understood his design. Odin was okay to me, and Maitreya just reminded me of how that whole team was just an annoyance throughout the game with their boss fights. Dagda is probably one of the most important demons in the game since he brings you back from the dead and grants you some of his epic powers. You'll find you spend a lot of the game fulfilling his wishes as his god slayer, but even though I know he comes from Irish descent, he still throws me off with that accent. I don't know why, but I just didn't expect that going into the game and it still cracks me up to this day. I can definitely appreciate the team's effort to make him as authentic as possible. This title also had some other interesting features like the partner system, which I actually really enjoyed. I liked the fact enemies could target either you or the party, especially the fact that even if they were knocked out, they would auto-revive in a few turns, even if sometimes it felt a bit overpowered. I can remember a few times where it definitely saved me. One of the other changes I liked was to smirk, which now allowed additional effects and status ailments, along with a 100% critical and hit rate. However, the one part of it that I did not agree with was Kamu slash Mudo spells only working when smirking, which led to some interesting encounters. Now we'll finally talk about the app system in this game, which follows a similar formula to its predecessor and allows you to have more freedom around customizing your character. I always like these because it allows you to create some interesting builds, whether it's magic, strength, or combination. The final thing I'll mention about the gameplay is the artwork changes that were made from the previous games. You'll notice a combo of designs that sometimes doesn't match each other's aesthetic. That would be because while some designs are being reused from 4, some were redesigned by Doi, who has a very distinct art style. Sorry to do this to my man Doi, but honestly, he has my least favorite art style out of all the artists of the series. When it comes to changes made to things like the overworld, I think I stand for many of us when I say I appreciate the slice of life changes, as they made maps have easier traversals, showed quest points, and generally made it easier to interact with. To say the least, this is definitely not my favorite entry in the series, but it's not necessarily one I hate either. I think it provides a lighthearted Megaton experience with more of a focus on the cast and characters. It's one game that I think any Megaton fan would enjoy. Oh god, where do I even start with this? At this point, I have played and finished every mainline SMT game except for 9, and Apocalypse is the one where I cannot give you a straight answer about where I stand with it. There is a lot this game does right, but there's more that it does wrong. What it does well is really, really good. The gameplay is pretty damn stellar. The dungeons are this game's strong suit, 
SMT4 didn't have many dungeons, and while I feel like the game was still able to make up for it, Apocalypse goes out of its way to fix this issue. None of the new dungeons look like each other, leading to tons of visual variety that makes each and every one feel distinct. The bottom of a well, a cherry blossom forest. This isn't even touching on the dungeons from the original game. Some, like Tsukiji Kongwanji, are reworked with new areas bolted on that help them feel refreshed. There are some areas from 4 that are completely optional, such as anything past the entrance to Midtown. While there's no story reason to go there, you're rewarded various items and other things that make it totally worthwhile to revisit them. I love how wacky the armor designs get. There are some returning outfits, but they're accompanied by Kamen Rider armor, backwards Pyrojack cosplay, and thanks to this game's DLC, you can even cosplay as your average Best Buy employee. The world map has been reworked, and it's been made much easier to navigate. While I personally never had an issue with the old one, I'd be lying if I said this map wasn't an improvement. The reworked partner system is a godsend. In the first game, I barely ever noticed it unless it came in clutch or it completely screwed me over. In Apocalypse, it's practically necessary. I mainly stuck with Navarre because, hey, free buffs, but each partner comes with their own probes that make it worth it to switch them up occasionally. When it comes to gameplay issues, I don't really have a ton. I'm not a fan of how insta-kill on light and dark spells have been restricted to smirking only. It kind of removes some of the identity Hama and Mudo had. The Jade Dagger is a neat little addition, but the puzzles that employ it range from great exercises in how to optimally traverse the map to annoying time wasters. It's very much a take it or leave it kind of thing for me. The real problems come in with the story and characters. Tonally, this game is much lighter compared to your standard SMT game. If I was to compare it to anything, I'd have to say Apocalypse is like early Hunter x Hunter. It has an edge to it and it can get dark, but it never really overrides the atmosphere. Meanwhile, the rest of this series is like Devilman, but without all of the nihilism. Having played every game in the last year, I can say that every entry in this series has an oppressive atmosphere that each one builds upon in its own way. All of them, except Apocalypse. And a large part of that is due to this game's cast. Apocalypse feels driven less by its world and more by its characters. It gives you a huge party that bickers and has moments where you just watch them all interact with each other. The problem is that they write these characters in a way that just doesn't fit with the vibe and identity of the series. SMT isn't known for having the most memorable or best written casts, but I never feel like they're the kind of characters you'd find in other games executed in the same way. Meanwhile, in Apocalypse, the cast all feel like archetypes you'd find in tons of other JRPGs. Navarre is the egotistical but quirky mascot character. Nozomi is the group mom who says hip lingo and I can't tell if it's meant to be ironic or not. Gaston is all hoity-toity and thinks he's better than everyone. Toki is the Yandere Kudere, whatever, who goes through a really weird and uncomfortable emotional journey. Hallelujah is a chill dude who wants to become stronger, but he's also the only character who left like no impact on me, so he's kind of like, whatever. And Asahi is the childhood friend who wants to do the cool job, secretly likes you, and is a sweet female character who says nice thi- Oh, Uh oh. In a different game, this cast wouldn't feel that out of the ordinary, but for SMT, it's just strange. It doesn't help that the dialogue can also just be awful sometimes. No clue. Home Slice just went banana cakes about it all of a sudden. Some scenes exist exclusively to let the characters banter and play off of each other, but it just doesn't work as it can come off as tropey and out of place. For instance, in the latter half of the game, a love triangle is introduced that's just actually the worst thing in the entire game, and anytime it comes up, I can just feel my eyes rolling into the back of my head. But I think my biggest issue with the game is that it removes the philosophical aspects of SMT, the thing that made it stand out so much in the first place, and replaces it with a black and white system that pretends its two main endings are equally valid. This game is heavily biased towards the Bond ending. Dagda, who represents the Massacre ending, is a 
horribly written character who never gives you any reason to join his side. All he ever says is that friends are a burden, but the game goes out of its way both on a narrative and a gameplay level to disprove that. The story shows time and time again the positives of having friends and helping each other, while the partner system is incredibly useful and is practically necessary in combat. SMT has always had a bias towards specific endings. SMT 1 and 4 portray the neutral ending as the best endings, but it still feels like the game never necessarily shows neutral as being the correct choice until you actually obtain that ending. It lets the extreme speak for themselves, and if you end up neutral, the game then shows you why it was the best option. But even if you pick Law or Chaos, you aren't shamed for siding with them at any point. You're just shown the negatives of that ending, alongside the positives. All of the quote unquote massacre choices throughout the game are just being an asshole to people for no reason and it's almost always followed up with a character admonishing you for acting this way or being confused as to why you would do this. These choices are also just incredibly unreasonable and edgy. The funny thing is, is that your choices throughout the game don't even affect anything. Not only does every character treat you the exact same way, even if you choose every single massacre answer and act like a sociopath, but what determines the ending you get is a single choice right before the final dungeon. If your choice doesn't line up with your actions, you are punished during the boss fight that immediately follows, but it makes your choices throughout the game feel utterly trivial. Hell, I made my choices based on a freaking coin flip in my recent playthrough. There's way more I could go into, such as my feelings on how this game handles the lore of SMT4, but I kind of just want to move on from the negativity because there are things I like about this game's narrative. For instance, even back during my first playthrough, I loved the Divine Powers. Krishna is a fantastic antagonist with amazing voice acting. He's just so intimidating and charismatic that every time he's on screen, he just demands my attention without ever breaking his composure. Odin is equally as intimidating, but he's also just cool. He and Maitreya just kind of follow Krishna's orders, but he still leaves a strong impression. His relationship with Gaston especially is really cool and interesting. As for Maitreya, he's the only one of the divine powers that I don't much care for. His weird voice doesn't fit, and I heavily prefer his beta design. However, he's made up for with Krishna's giant snake, Shesha. Shesha literally bursts into the game in the most oh shit way possible and every encounter with it is oppressive and scary. Shesha is literally the only demon in the entire game to get a 3D model. That is how freaking important and awesome it is. The beginning of the game is also great at making you feel small and unimportant. Nanashi and Asahi are beginner hunters who don't matter in the opening few hours of the game. You are just another hunter trying to help others however you can. When you play any other SMT game, a demon like Angel is a non-threat, but for Nanashi, Angel is a freaking mini-boss. There's also a bigger focus on the average person living in Tokyo and seeing how the major players of 4 affect them. It feels down to earth in that respect, and I really appreciate seeing things from the perspective of someone who isn't the chosen one for that world. At least they aren't, until they are. Then there are things like, uh, spoiler alert, skip ahead like 5 seconds, how characters literally can't say Yahweh's name and it's instead replaced by a digital record scratch. Oh god, and the music? Jesus Christ. Back during the 25th anniversary of the series, there was a fan voting to determine the best tracks in the series. Only one of Ryota Kozuka's tracks came in in the top 20, and it was literally the 20th place. The only conclusion I can come to is that the Japanese fanbase doesn't know what good music is. While divisive, Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse is still a great game that I would recommend to anyone who is interested in playing. The combat is addictive, the dungeons are fantastic, the music is absolutely stellar, and depending on what you're looking for, the story is an interesting excursion back into the underground world of Tokyo. If you played SMT4 and want to spend more time in this world, this is not a bad way to do it. If you're brand new to 4 in its world, I would recommend playing the original game first before you jump into this one. 
Oh, and by the way, the 3DS is the only way to play it. There, that's your how to play it. The 3DS, full stop. You know, the weird thing is that while 4 only had a digital release in Europe, Apocalypse got a physical one. It's kind of funny. Wait. Is it over? Did I just complete a selling you on for every mainline SMT game in a year? Oh my god, I just did, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yes! I'm finally done! <laughs> I got the views, I got the praise, I got the attention! Now I can move away from this stupid series and never look back at it! I can talk about all the things I want to talk about! Okay, what do I got first on my video idea list? A video talking about the movies If and Annihilation and comparing them with Shin Megami Tensei If and Strange Journey. Oh, 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 how about a video talking about how the first 10 chapters of Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth are incredibly similar to Shin Megami Tensei Devil Summoner Soul Hackers? Come on, come on, come on. Uh, okay, this one doesn't have SMT anywhere in it. How about a follow-up video where I see if the new Atlas Online store is an improvement on the old one? Did I just put myself in a box? Am I gonna be doing Shin Megami Tensei-based content for the rest of my life? Is this the result of gaining an audience based around a niche Japanese role-playing game series that has a dedicated fan base? Am I never gonna be able to make videos about anything non-Atlas ever again? Why not just keep making SMT videos while doing stuff on other Japanese games, like you've been doing? Huh. I didn't think of that. Thanks, Gab! But more importantly, thank you to everyone who's watched these videos over the last year. I've been going through a lot, and it's really worn me down. There were times where I felt like I was just in a rut, that my life was going nowhere. I don't want to be stuck working the jobs I have been for the rest of my life, and I've been working hard to keep that from happening. While I still have a long way to go, it's been the support these videos have gotten that have kept me going. I appreciate every bit of support you guys have given me thus far, and I hope you continue to do so in the future. I still plan to make videos on SMT, but I hope you'll stick around for the times when I mix things up some. You have no idea how much it means to me. Whether it be by donating to my Patreon, subscribing and hitting the bell, or simply just watching this video to the end. I just want you to know how much I appreciate it. Thank you. Aw, that's sweet, Maka. Can I go home now? Yeah, you know what? I've been a real jackass. I'm sorry. Let me take you home now. You know you skipped over SMT9, right? Let me know when that game is fully translated into English and I'll get back to you. <laughs> Ow! What the hell? Wait. Is this? Take me home first. Come